Again, folks, we're just doing a quick, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our monthly webinar. Um, just to, before we get started, I wanna share with you a little bit about the American School Health Association and who we are. The mission of the American School Health Association is to transform all schools into places where every student learns and thrives. And we envision healthy students who learn and achieve in safe and healthy environments, nurtured by caring adults, functioning within a coordinated school and community support system. My name is Jeannie Alter and I'm the Executive Director of the American School Health Association and I'm thankful that you're joining us today. A little bit about ASHA and the benefits of being a member. We have the Journal of School Health, which is our peer-reviewed professional journal. Um, as a member, you get a copy of our journal um, print or online. You also get access to um, the latest in school health through our annual conference. We have a bi-weekly newsletter and we have networking communities that are, um, are full of our very knowledgeable members. We have continuing education and our members receive free continuing education credits. We have a career center, which offers discount rates for job postings for our career center. Um, we also have within our career center, um, an area where you can post and um, post for interns and interns can look for um, appropriate internships. And we also have um, the American Academy of Pediatrics offers a publications discount to all ASHA members. I want to remind you that we are going to be in Cincinnati for our 93rd Annual School Health Conference, October 2nd through the 4th. So we hope that you all will join us in beautiful Cincinnati. And it will be a wonderful time, lots of great sessions, great posters. It should be a wonderful time. So today I want to introduce you to our two presenters. Today we have Melissa Horn Speck. She is a graduate of Eastern Illinois University with a Master's of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics with a specialization in education. After working in a clinical setting, Melissa decided to switch her focus to a more preventative form of health care. And this led her to its All About Kids School Health Program at the Tulsa Health Department. In this position, she writes and implements nutrition curriculum that is aligned to state standards and can be modified to fit into most classroom settings. She also writes and facilitates community cooking demonstrations that can be seen on Facebook twice a month. And when not writing and testing new recipes, Melissa enjoys spending her free time exploring the world with her two-year-old son, Reese. We also have Megan Parks. Megan is one of the school health registered dietitians with It's All About Kids program of the Tulsa Health Department. She has a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State University in Nutritional Sciences and is currently working on her Master's of Professional Practice in Dietetics from Iowa State University. Terrific! She has three years experience of working at Women, Infants, and Children's Program, or WIC. She has over two years of experience of working with um, school health programs, creating and implementing nutrition curriculum, writing and creating recipes for community cooking demos, and teaching and creating nutrition PE games. In her free time, she enjoys sewing, running, and spending time with her family. So we welcome both Melissa and Megan today, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, Thank let me you. get my screen shared here. And we will go ahead and get started. Um, oh. Exit. Oh, sorry, this is Caitlin. And I also just want to let people know that if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box and we will hold off until the end to answer those. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So as they said, um, I am Melissa and this is Megan and we are, why is my, give me a minute. I was trying that. There we go technical difficulties, but we've gotten there now. Um, and we are both registered dietitians with the Tulsa Health Department. It's all about kids program. So as dietitians working in school health, we focus on building and facilitating nutrition education programs for elementary age students 
in Oklahoma, there is no education, um, health education mandated in the curriculum standards, which means it's not something that's prioritized during classroom time. Most of that time, particularly for third through fifth grade, because we're elementary, um, is devoted to teaching what will be evaluated in the state tests they take in spring. So that's where blending nutrition and education comes in. When Megan and I write curriculum, we're making sure that our lessons are tied to state standards for health education, physical education, math, science, and language arts where it's appropriate. So if we are in a classroom setting, the teachers feel not only is the content that we have valuable, we're still also hitting those core curriculum standards that they need to be hitting every single day. So a little bit of a history lesson um, on nutrition in schools and why it's an important and appropriate place for nutrition education. So nutrition has had a place in schools as early as 1946. And during World War II, nearly half of the draft eligible men were found to be unfit for service due to malnutrition related consequences. So President Truman signed the National School Lunch Act of 1946. This act outlined um, the purpose and policies for a comprehensive federal program for school-aged children, setting an affordable price for students who were able to pay and a provision for free meals for students who, for families who qualified. These meals were designed to provide 33 to 50% of a child's daily caloric needs. And until 1966, that program was pretty much unchanged. In 1966, a pilot program for breakfast was introduced with the Child Nutrition Act which expanded nationwide in 1975 with the passage of the National School Breakfast Program. And again, after 1975, those programs remained largely unchanged. There were tweaks here and there to the nutrition, to the funding, um, to the reimbursement, but for the most part, there weren't any um, large changes until 2010, and that was when the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was passed. And that expanded the focus to meeting a child's nutrition needs associated with obesity, as well as hunger and food insecurity. Hi, Melissa, I'm going to interrupt. Could you move your microphone maybe just a little closer? We have a few people that are having difficult hearing. I can move the computer, but we don't have an external mic, so it's whatever's embedded in our computer. So is that better? Uh, it sounds good to me. Everyone else? Maybe do another sound check. Is that, how are we doing? Someone said it sounds better. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, we just have whatever's in the computer. We don't have an external mic, so we're, we'll do the best we can. So nutrition in a school setting, um, we're now at 2010 with the passing of the Health or Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, or HHFKA, which is not any easier to say than Healthy <laughs> Hunger Free Kids. This act represents a major change to the national school lunch and breakfast programs. Originally, these programs, remember, were designed to meet 33 to 50% of the caloric needs, thinking most students eat breakfast at home, go to school, have lunch at school, go home, have a snack, and then have a dinner. But that's not the reality for most students, particularly those who need or who qualify for free breakfast and lunch. So for a lot of those students, the, school, the food they get in school is the only food they're getting on a reliable basis. Um, with this growth of food insecurity, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act brought about some changes. Some of these changes are with the actual food on the plate, the nutritional standards, which I'll get into, you know, making sure we had whole grain rich foods, low fat milk, limiting the added sugar and sodium standards, increasing the fruit and vegetable offerings and requirements for different varieties of fruit and vegetables. But there were also changes to the program itself. They added some more provisions, one of which is the community eligibility provision, which is a program that allows schools in higher poverty areas to qualify to have the entire school population receive free breakfast and lunch, not just those who individually qualify. And one of our districts here in Tulsa County, Tulsa Public Schools, which is the second largest district in the state, is one of those schools, their elementary schools, um, all qualify for CEP. So every elementary age child in Tulsa Public Schools receives free breakfast and lunch, regardless of socioeconomic status, there is no extra line, there's no paperwork to fill out, there's no different food that those kids get as opposed to the other kids. Everybody goes through the same line, everybody makes their choices off the same thing, and everybody leaves with a tray unless they bring their lunch. So I think that's really helpful for, for removing some of that stigma associated with free breakfast and lunch. There's also the summer food service program because you think about that when school's not in session, kids aren't getting fed if the only food they're getting is from school. 
So we have here in a lot of other places, there's a summer feeding program where children under the age of 18 can go to specific sites that are monitored and led by school districts and local food bank, and they get breakfast and lunch. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to be a member of a certain school district. You just have to be uh, under 18 and show up and they just make a little tally so they know how many people were there. And you've got that. There is also the after school snack program. So a lot of students stay after school, whether it's because they're in extended daycare or they are there for an after school program like Megan and I teach. So there is um, a provision made for after school snacks. So if they've eaten lunch at 11, 11.30, school after school programming starts at three, they are not gonna get home until five. They're hungry, I'm hungry. So, you know, they're gonna want that. Um, offer versus serve, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about on the next slide. The Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which is a program where schools have the opportunity to bring in extra fruits and vegetables that may not be quite as familiar to students. The cafeteria staff will prepare them. They bring them to the classroom and the students have the opportunity to experience them, taste them, play with them, whatever they choose to do with them there. We know that the more a child is exposed to new foods, the more likely they are to accept those foods. So that helps with that um, food acceptance. Each district was tasked to set their own requirements for nutrition education within their own district wellness policy. And they found by 2014 that 90% of the district policies included goals for nutrition education, but there's no extra money associated with that, which is kind of where Megan and I will come into. So the nutritional requirements that changed with Healthy Hunger Free Kids, this is where Offer versus Serve really comes into play. So Offer versus Serve was initially, if they were receiving free breakfast or lunch, they would get these five items, they had to take them all in order for it to be a reimbursable meal. But with offer, offer versus serve, in order to decrease plate waste, they don't have to take all five items anymore. So every time, day at lunch, they have to offer five different things. So they need a meat or meat alternative, they need grains, half of which need to be whole grain rich, fruits, vegetables, and there's different categories of vegetables that need to be hit in certain amounts on a weekly basis. Um, fluid and fluid milk. So those are your five choices and they always have to offer them, but students only need to take three of them to make it count as a reimbursable meal. One of those three has to be the fruit or the vegetable, but otherwise they can choose whatever they want. And I've got my, um, my picture here. So when Megan and I work with child nutrition departments, which when we go in during the school day, we are, um, we get to eat school lunch because we're working with child nutrition, child nutrition feeds us. And so this was a lunch I had one day at a Tulsa public school. And you'll see all five components are there on the plate. I've got my, my fluid milk, I've got my vegetables, I've got dark green with my broccoli and other with my um, cauliflower because it's white so it doesn't fit in the category. I've got my fruit that's packed in juice instead of syrup. And then I've got my whole grain rich bun and my um, chicken patty, which was a baked chicken patty of white meat. So there's your meat and meat alternative. And I gotta say, it was pretty good. Yeah, we enjoy the food. We like the food. <laughs> So now we're going to be talking about nutrition education. So this is from a paper from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, defining it. A nutrition education is defined as all of the educational activities that engage students, not only through direct classroom education, but also through other venues throughout the school day that are designed to motivate students and facilitate adoption of helpful food choices accompanied by a supportive school environment. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, and that's where Melissa and I come in. And so bringing that full circle, so when the students are receiving those healthier options at lunchtime, also coming in and bringing the education for the students to really understand it. So why are they getting the um, whole grain rich? Or why are they having fruits and vegetables that aren't deep fried? And so, um, and we bring in curriculum. So the teachers are very, they have a lot of standards that they have to get through and um, bringing in a new expert that we have the curriculum set up to match Oklahoma standards we can come in and provide that curriculum for the teachers and for the students and also for the students having somebody else come in as well it's always um, fun when yes. it's not their teacher so it's something special and different yeah, and they get to learn from us so implementing nutrition education so from that same paper that I just quoted um, they have different um, topics to really focus on to really bring good education in. 
So targeting specific behaviors and practices. So we will go in and, and talk with the kids why it's important to eat breakfast um, and encouraging to try new foods and then including experiences in growing and preparing food. So you see uh, we have a couple of our students here. So we're going to be talking about our cooking club, but it includes the students in ex um, preparing the food um, because studies show that when the kids are able to help prepare foods, they're more likely to try it. And as Melissa mentioned earlier, exposing the kids to those foods as well more often encourages them to eat it as well. Um, delivering coherent and clearly focused curricula linked closely to national and local educational standards. So as we discussed, um, making sure it aligns with Oklahoma education standards. So we bring in um, science and math and language arts. She can do that a lot with nutrition. Yeah. We're talking about food labels, recipes, multiply this recipe. If you need two batches of the cookies, how are you going to do that? Um, and then providing appropriate teacher training and support. So we do provide um, professional development where we can come in for one to two hours. We can bring all the um, PE teachers together and show them different nutrition games that they can bring back to their classrooms. Megan, could you scoot the computer a little bit closer to you, please? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for telling me. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's get closer to our faces. Hi. Yes. So it brings us to our program. It's all about kids. Uh, we have been around since 2004. We have one supervisor, one manager, two full-time RDNs, uh, our registered dietitians, um, five full-time health educators, and then also a registered nurse. So IAK program, we align ours with the whole school, whole community, whole child or risk model that you see on the screen. It's an ecological approach to learning and health with 10 components. It is CDC's framework for addressing health in schools. It aligns learning and health and where the child is in the center to emphasize the primary focus of the model. Parents, schools, and communities work collaboratively around the child to improve health and academic achievement, to improve each child's cognitive, physical, social, and emotional development. So you will notice on there that um, the nutrition is just one component. However, we'll talk about how nutrition can fit into more than just the nutrition component and how we can bring it around. Um, IEK, we partner with um, local Tulsa County schools where each individual, not just the district, but each individual school fills out a school readiness assessment where we discover their needs. And they fill that out yearly because staffing changes, needs change, change. needs change. Um, and we have them focus on three components of the model. So we can come in and we sit down and we have a meeting with them after they fill out that needs assessment. And so that we, way we can help them meet their goals. So with our health educators, they do bully busters, hygiene, mindfulness. Um, they have a lot that they can bring in. And then we will be talking today about what we do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, TulsaPlay.org is where you can go on our website to find. We have a ton of resources on there. We have a lot of our curriculum on there. Mm -hmm. So you can go and, and learn more about our program. And one of those programs is our Blender Bike program, which um, I'm really proud of. So when we, we first encountered the Blender Bikes um, through Tulsa Public Schools with their Farm to Market program, which is a twice yearly event that they hold where they bus students to a centralized location, actually to their district bakery where they prepare all and make all of their baked goods for the district. And they've got different vendors set up, farmers, um, food sources, there's a mobile grocery, and they learn about where their food comes from because not everybody knows how it gets to the grocery store, how it gets to their plate. And we had the blender bikes there. TPS actually purchased the uh, blender bike with um, grant money that they received from TSET, which is the to uh, Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. And they were able to buy one of these bikes, so one of these um, standalone bikes, and then they got nine conversion kits, which are about a quarter of the price of the um, standalone bikes that you put onto traditional bikes on trainers that they have in all of their high schools that they use for nutrition education. So when they first got their bike, their dietitian was told to find a way to use them. And um, they came to us as one of their community partners and we started partnering with them at Bike Club. So Bike Club is another wonderful organization mm -hmm. that we are just a tiny little cog in the wheel of their circuit <laughs> partners. But um, Bike Club is an after-school club that was started in 2014 at one elementary school in Tulsa Public Schools. They are now in 19 different TPS schools 
and they also are have their toolkit has been used at some other Tulsa schools. Um, so they're in even more than that. It is a 20 to 25 week long after school club for 20 students to learn life skills through cycling, which I think is amazing. Um, it's, it's a huge volunteer presence, it's a huge community presence. The kids learn so many different skills, not just how to ride and maintain a bike, even though that's a life skill that will get them through quite a bit, few things. And like I said, we are just one of the community partners and we come and we go and present at each one of those clubs with the blender bike. When we first started with the TPS bike that first year, we were making a recipe of a green smoothie, which was peaches, pineapple, yogurt, and spinach. So we would go and talk about food as fuel and why what you put in your body impacts or how what you put in your body impacts how you can ride a bike or think or run or do all the things that you want to do. Um, and we did it with a green smoothie because we wanted them to see something that was a funny color. And <laughs> that's why we made it bright green. Um, the second year, um, this is after we purchased our own bikes, we did a pineapple salsa. And the pineapple salsa, we had the students taste with um, a salty something, a tortilla chip, and then a sweet something. And that was the cinnamon sugar pita chip. And we wanted them to see how when you pair foods with different things, it changes the flavor of it. So if you always taste something one way, and you're like, well, I don't like that because I had it that one time that one way. Well, if you prepare it differently, you may you know, it, you may change your mind. Like you may have always had Brussels sprouts boiled and you're like, I don't like Brussels sprouts. And then someone gives you, you know, roasted Brussels sprouts with bacon. You're like, well, where has this been my whole entire life? <laughs> I thought I didn't even like Brussels sprouts. So it's that kind of idea showing them how foods can change just by what you put them with. And then um, last year with Bike Club, we changed the focus a little bit to talking about non-animal protein sources. So we made a hummus and we talked about, talking about protein in general, because I think a lot of kids out there think that like, it, because of advertising, protein is the most important thing you need to put in your body at all times. You need more protein, more and more and more. And when you ask kids what's a good protein source, someone's always going to say protein shake or protein bar. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about ways to get protein into your body that are um, more bioavailable um, sources from foods, but also the appropriate amounts of protein for your body and how we sometimes eat more than we, we need. We think we need more than we do. So. Um, that is what we do at Bike Club. So we really saw a bunch of enthusiasm for about the Blender Bike and at Bike Club. So we decided um, at that first year that we needed to purchase our own Blender okay. Bike at IAK. So we did. In January of 2017, we got our very own bike. And initially, we were just using it like at parent events and STEM nights and literacy yeah. nights, um, the summer cafe kickoffs of the summer feeding program. The first day, we like to have big party. Um, the bookmobiles there and um, a lot of different community partners so they know hey this is a site where you can come get food and we have the blender bikes there which always brings people over because they're interested in it and then we give them education while they're there um you know covertly so that's how we were really using it but we wanted to make it a little bit more consistent and we wanted to really expand that reach and that was when we decided to collaborate with our school districts and see if we could get into the schools we first approached union school district and they, they, they really liked the idea of building that class. And then we went back to TPS and said, well, you have a bike already, so can we come into your schools too? And, and we did, and that's how we came about our day-long blender bike classes. So our day-long blender bike classes are, they're a lot. <laughs> so during these classes, we bring the entire grade into the gym at once during their specials period, and we break them up into Three different, well, first we give them a little lesson about what we're yes. talking about. Currently, dairy is our topic of the day. And then we break them into three groups and we have them go through a rotation. So one of the groups will start at the bike. If they're third through fifth grade, they'll ride the bike and taste the smoothie. If they're younger, they'll see how the bike works and taste the smoothie and work on a little worksheet. And then they rotate to, through the other rotations, which are um, PE games that Megan has modified to be a nutrition focus. So they're not. She didn't invent new games because really I think there's right. only like seven games out there, but there's just a new take on them and there's more than that. And giving them a nutrition spin. And that way we're reinforcing the nutrition lesson that we gave them at the beginning, but we're also getting them up and moving and active, yeah. um, which we know helps children learn better if they are up and moving and active. So as Melissa mentioned, um, they have a little worksheet that they do. So when they come and they ride the bike, we give them this worksheet in the hopes that they take it home too. So as I spoke in the beginning about the WISP model, and there's also 
family involvement. So our hope is that they take this worksheet home to their parents that they can see. So you will notice that in the middle, that is the one that is the front of both worksheets. So the ingredients are at the top, nutrition information is in the middle, and there's some great very facts that they go over the kids in the beginning when we talk with them, and then they learn again with Melissa and Nisha throughout with the different um, stations. On the left with the um, work Research is for the third through sixth grade students, so they love sitting down, working on it together. And then on the right, it's for the kindergarten through second grade. So you'll notice we have a blank blender and then just some fruit on the outside. We encourage creativity with their own smoothie, and so uh, some kids will put meatballs in it or, or pizza. I always tell them I love chocolate and bananas, and some kids will do that, but they get so proud and they color it in and they. I mean, so many kids yeah, run off and, and I think yeah. it's really interesting like half of them will do the whole foods in it and the other half will just like make yeah. it a color and be mm -hmm. like it's blended I did it and yeah. I don't know if they're being creative or they just didn't feel like drawing yeah but, but it's fun to see the different ones because they get very creative with it so with our berry smoothie when Melissa and I will go into Walmart website and the reason why we do Walmart website is just because it's easy online to do it and it shows us the price right there and we can choose a particular store but we will go in and um, price that out. So when we've done that for like community events, um, it ends up being about 30 to 43 cents per sample. So we found working with the child nutrition department is much more cost effective for the school when we're in the school for the Splinter Bike program. So um, the Tulsa Public Schools TPS, he has told, the dietitian is over there has told us that it's 20 cents per student. And he likes to joke that the biggest cost is the cup and labor of it. Um, and just to put in perspective on how cheap and cost effective that is, we have a fine dining program where it's $20 per student. So we can hit a ton of students at a very low cost. Yeah. Um, so when you're looking at the bikes, I mean, yes, the bike itself is initially an expensive investment. I think ours cost about $2,400. Yeah. Um, and then we got it customized. So it, it can be, but it's about that. So it's a lot on the front end, but the amount of return on investment you get is it's amazing. And like I said, the conversion kits are about a quarter of the cost. So that's another way to do that. Yes. Okay. And then now this is our post-test data results. After the class, we do an initial post-test and then we do a 60-day post-test. We want to see, do they retain the knowledge that they've learned? Um, and so we do it on a piece of paper where the kids fill it out. And it's just four questions long. Three nutrition questions, one behavior change question. So we've got a dairy food group question because we give, and it's all multiple choice. So we give them a list. Which foods belong in the dairy food group? But, you know, is it? Um, and it's all the fruit? ingredients of the smoothie. Yes. And so they have to choose which one. And then which nutrients do you find in the dairy food group? Vitamin D and blank. So they have to choose which one they think, which is calcium. And then again, dairy servings, one, two, three, or four, and hoping that they choose three. And then the behavior change question. So on the initial post-test, we ask them, um, how likely do you think you are to make this movie at home? And then on the 60-day post-test, we ask, do you actually make this movie at home? So if you look at our 2017 to 2018 data, and then our 2018 to 2019 data, with the green being the initial post-test and the orange being the 60-day post-test, you'll notice that they do retain the knowledge pretty well. There's a, a little bit bigger difference 2018 to 2019 just because we expand. I mean, we our sample size was a lot bigger, so that's probably more accurate because you know the larger your yeah. sample size is, more the more accurate your results are going to be. But you will see on the behavior change, it drops from kids thinking they will make this movie to they, they don't. But however, we don't know the answers on why. We don't know if it's the family doesn't have the means to buy a blender or, or the ingredients, or maybe they lost the worksheet with the smoothie on it. So, um, but yeah, that's, we always like to, and we just post test the third through fifth grade student on that. So lessons learned, as we've done this for um, a couple of years now, yeah, a couple of years. So like I had mentioned, the partnership with the child nutrition department is um, absolutely essential because number one, it gets, like you said, it gets the smoothie so much cheaper. Yeah. But also when we're going to the schools, we're there all day. So borrowing their materials, using the fridge, so we send them a list before we come to the school. Um, may we use these these things of um, you know, sheet pans. We need a cart, we need sheet pans, we need yes. spoodles, we need hotel pans, we need your, your sink so we can sanitize, we need your refrigeration so we can keep things at temp. Like, all these things that if we're random people walking into their kitchen, they're gonna be like, who are you? If yeah. we're walking in with their child nutrition department, 
then it's a little then it's more, fine. Yeah. And also, and we like to email them so we're not just talking to them like, hey, this and because they're busy. Um, and then our evaluations that I just spoke with you about, um, we do right now, we have them on paper. However, we're moving towards, we used this a little bit last year, but we're going to move forward to only doing it on clickers. It's an app. Um, so you can download it for free. And this is much more environmentally better because it's all on paper that the kids are filling it out. And then we have one of our staff members go in and put them into SurveyMonkey. So that takes a lot of time doing that. And also it's human error too, if we accidentally enter them in wrong. But, um, and I guess we can have a little bit, of, we can have error on clickers too. But with the clickers, we use it on our app and we just print a sheet that almost looks like a QR code. And the kids put it up in the position, either the position they have it in is A, B, C, or D. And when you get the data like that, you will see, okay, 50% of the kids knew the question, to the, um, the correct answer, and the other 50% didn't. You get the data right there. Um, recipe. Oh, and also being able to do the flickers in the actual classroom, because we've had it sometimes where we can't get the initial, initial post-test till maybe a week later, just depending on what's going on in the school. Typically, we're there on Fridays. Um, some schools, they're only, we only are with them for 30 minutes, while other schools are with them for an hour. And so um, we always just try to fill that in. Recipes, we, like we have mentioned, we're doing a berry smoothie. We've been doing that. Union Public Schools is going to change it to a hummus, so we're going to focus on protein that time. And stations. So Melissa explains about the three stations that we have. However, like I had just talked about, um, some schools, we only have 30 minutes with the kids. Uh, other schools, you know, we might have 55 minutes or an hour. And so it's a lot of time for transitioning the kids, explaining the games. Um, it gets getting them lined up, getting them lined up, especially the little, the little kindergartners yeah. in the beginning of the year. Um, so our manager found this really cool game that she adapted to nutrition that we can use for all of the kids are playing the same game. And then we'll bring in a group of them to still ride the bike, all the older ones, get their um, smoothie in their worksheet. So we're changing that as well this year. So we haven't done it yet, but that's what we're going to change this year. And then this shows our numbers that how much is increased by having these other bikes. So in the 2015 to 2016 school year, we reached over 8,000 students. And that's we had, um, like we're going to talk about more an after school program, we had a garden program at the time. And that's family night, um, sugar shockers, sugar shockers so nutrition PE, nutrition PE, um, nutrition education in the classroom. Now, 2016 to 2017, when we got that first bike, and this is just bike clubs that we had at And then parent STEM events, night. STEM nights, yes. farm student. And so that was an increase by 200%. So over 16,000 students we were reaching with nutrition education. And you will see by 2017 to 2018 school year, that increased by another 147%, reaching over 24,000. And that's when we implemented the Splinter Bike program. So we're able to reach so many children. And then 2018 to 2019, our numbers are still not compiled. We, within the health department, we have um, an epidemiology program that we, they're amazing. We work with them on all of our data and our numbers. And so that hasn't all been compiled yet because our fiscal year runs from July to June. to June. And you'll see on the right side of the screen additional events that we've also talked about that we bring the Blender Bikes in, um, STEM and Math and Literacy Night, because we can talk to them about doubling recipes, um, end of the school year events, farm to market. We can bring them a lot. Um, which brings us to our other big program, which is our after school program, and that's Cooking Club. And the funny thing about Cooking Club is it started as a garden club, which makes perfect sense because school gardens are an incredibly valuable resource. You can teach students about where food comes from, how it's grown. A lot of kids don't know that things grow under the ground or above the ground, all those things. The problem we discovered is you can't have a school garden one day a week for eight weeks and have anything survive. And this picture, don't, yeah. let, don't let this picture fool you. So this was from one of our summer programs, and it was the second summer program we did. And the first one, we were like, oh, let's have them plant radish yeah. seeds, because radishes grow really fast, and it's great. And they all died. So then we were like, well, let's get seedlings. And they're more established plants. They'll, they'll live longer. So we got those. And that was the day we planted them. Yeah. And we don't have an after picture, we didn't want um, an after but picture. It, was, it, was, it was very sad. <laughs> 
So while the lessons that we wrote for Garden Club were incredibly valuable, and we still use them, we adapted mm -hmm. them to Cooking Club, the, the Garden Club itself, unless you have a dedicated person or ideally persons at a school who is going to um, maintain that garden on a daily basis and over the summer, it, it's not going to last. It, 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 you can't garden one day a week. So one day, Megan and I were in a planning meeting with one of the community school coordinators at a union school where we had had a garden club. And we we're trying to figure out something else we could do that would incorporate that, but be nutrition-y. And she was like, well, we have this box of cooking utensils from a, like a summer program. Do you think you could do something with that? And Megan and I both looked at each other and we're like, mm -hmm. okay. So quick thing about dietitians. Not every dietitian likes to cook. Some hate cooking. I love to cook. So we're like, well, yeah, we could do a cooking club. Yeah. So we did. So similar to our blunder bike class, the cooking club has gone through a lot of different changes. Megan and I did a lot of research into appropriate cooking skills for school-age children. We looked at cookbooks, pediatric guides, Ellen Satter workshops. Um, we looked at existing curriculum from Foodmaster, USDA's Teen Nutrition Life Plate, WIC lessons, SNAP Ed, California Dairy Council, um, different university extension agencies. Um, the OSU extension has some wonderful materials. Um, a lot of other extensions, university extensions do as well. It's just that we're in Oklahoma, so we see them a lot. Um, and the resources out there from nonprofit and governmental agencies are, are really good. They None of them really did exactly what we wanted, though. So we couldn't just take you know, an existing yeah. curriculum and be like, we're going to use this because it, it didn't meet what we needed it to. So we kind of picked and cherry picked and, and rewrote and tweaked until it was exactly what we wanted. Okay, so here's some materials that we bring to the school, but how we have it offered to the school, because when I talked about how we have a meeting with the school, they were really looking for ways to extend their day. So that's why we brought in the gardening club for an after school program and then changed it over to cooking club. So we offered as a two week back to back sessions. Um, so it, we reached 16 students per session, but we reached 32 students per semester per school. And then Melissa and I have split up so we can hit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we can hit six schools this semester. And so in the re another reason why we do the two five weeks back to back is because we do a pantry shopping. And so of so many of those materials, we don't need a whole lot of. So it was more But you still have to buy it in a certain amount. So if yep. you're buying a bag of flour, you're buying a bag of flour. If you're buying a thing of oil, even the small one, if you're only using, you know, a cup of it for one cooking club, well, you have two cups of oil there. So it doesn't really it doesn't double the cost to run it two two sessions back to back. Yeah. And so materials, it's all about kids now brings the materials to the school. So Melissa, when she was talking about when we first started this off, we used to have, you know, we wrote in a budget for this um, school to pay for it, for all the materials, but we found the schools are more receptive to cooking club and wanting it more when we bring the materials. So we were able to purchase um, a griddle because we do um, pancakes and eggs and, and we bread. have like, we have like six griddles. Yes. So we, we bring, we bring multiple. <laughs> And then we have cookie sheets, um, bowl, bowls, measuring cups, because we really talked to them about how we measure and liquid measuring cups as well. And so that's all the stuff that we bring. And the materials that the school provides, they have to provide the food. And so the pantry supplies the paper goods as well, so the plates they eat off of, the cups, and then the perishable food items. So what we do is we would do one big shop. And how we usually how it work with the schools is it costs them $250 for the two five-week back-to-back session. Yep. And so they usually provide us with a Walmart gift card, and we'll go and do one big pantry shopping of the um, just pantry food items like uh, vanilla extract, flour, flour, oil, any any pantry good. Yes. And then on the day of, we go and shop for the perishable food items like the bananas and the fruit and so forth. So here we have some of our kids in cooking club doing their work. So over here, we've got, um, talking about measuring, so all of our cooking club curriculum is written to meet Oklahoma standards for math, science, and language arts. But we also focus on basic cooking skills that are age appropriate for third through fifth graders. 
So here we have the measuring and mixing. So we show the kids the proper way to measure both liquids and solids. And we talk about how some solids need to be packed in, some solids need to be spooned in and then leveled off. Um, like brown sugar needs to be packed. Flour needs to be spooned. We even have an experiment where we have them, you know, measure the flour just by scooping it and weighing it and then measuring it properly and weighing it and seeing the difference there. So they understand that it really does make an impact and talk about, you know, what do you think you would do to your cookies if you had this much more flour mm -hmm. or will they taste the same if you measure it this way and you measure it that way. Um, so it, it's a huge difference and it really, I mean, baking is a science, so it, it makes a huge difference. We also talk about cooking terminology. So whisking, stirring, beating, folding, all of these terms that when you read a recipe, if you don't know what those words mean, you're gonna look at that recipe like, well, I can't make this. And we are really trying to empower these children to have the, the tools to go home and prepare food, to go home and help in the kitchen. Because we know that if you help in the kitchen, you're more likely to consume the food you're making. And our goal is to make sure that these children grow up to be competent eaters. We want them to have a healthy relationship with food. We want them to understand, yes, nutrition is very important. We also want them to, I mean, we've got a lot of food messages out there between mm -hmm. social media that are a, either untrue or just incredibly damaging or, or unhelpful. So we want to make sure these kids have those tools at their disposal. You will also see over here, we've got that, that being in mind, we've got label reading. So we do teach them how to read and interpret food labels. And one of the things that we do with that is we talk about how on the front of the package, that's usually, and most of the foods we consume come in a package of some sort. Um, the front of the package, it's, it's how they're trying to sell it to you. You know, it's 100% fat free. Yeah, but it's Twizzlers, so we're not surprised. <laughs> um, but the back of the package is what's in the food, whether it's the food label or the ingredient list or the common allergens that are in it. So we wanna make sure that they know how to read and interpret that and they don't just read, you know, the, the food claims on the front and think, well, this must be healthy because it told me that it has 100% vitamin C in it or something like that. So our next photo is, we also do a lot of science curriculum in Cooking Club. Food and science go together. We both have degrees in food science, nutrition science. So, and I always make a point of saying that, that we have a science degree because the first time I said it, there was a little girl who's probably in fourth or fifth grade and she looked up at me and she's like, you're a scientist? Like it had never crossed her mind that a girl could be a scientist. And now I'm like, yes. And I wanna wear like a cape or something. I am a scientist, my degree is in science. So we do science experiments. And this one I love, um, I think the first time I did this, I was probably in fifth grade myself. And it's just your basic, acid-base experiment where you take different foods and you see how an acid or a base impacts both their pigment and their texture. We have the kids also compare it to raw ones. We have them fill out a data set, make a hypothesis that when you pull that blue cabbage out of that, it is, yeah, their minds are cool. Full. Yes. So <laughs> it's, it's a fun one to do, but it also, you know, sneaks some science and there is an extension of that school day so that out of school time doesn't just turn into glorified babysitting. Yes. Okay, so again, we do obtain data from the Always. students. Always. Um, we do a pre-test on the very first day before we get, give them any education, and then on the last day after the they receive all the education, because we need to try to make sure at the end of the day. It's a nine-question test. We ask them eight nutrition questions and then one behavior question. And so the behavior questions, um, when, when Melissa and I were putting this um, presentation together, we... On the pre-test, we ask them, how often do you cook at home? On the post-test, we don't ask how often they cook at home. We just ask how likely are you to make the food, even though we want to know how likely they are to make the food. So next year, moving forward, we are going to ask, hey, do, are you cooking more at home? So wondering if, you know, after you've been in cooking club for five weeks, has that increased, it, has that increased the amount that you go into the kitchen and, and you are able to help? And we still want to know if they're going to go home and make the recipes yeah. afterwards because they get to take the books with them. We also want to know if over that five weeks we've had any change on their behaviors. Yeah. Um, and so a couple of the questions that we ask, for example, we ask which of the food does not belong in, a, in the grains group because that's something that we go over. We talk about the different parts of the plant. And so that's over here where you see potatoes at the bottom. And so um, we'll put pancakes in there and uh, a couple other grains and then potatoes. And so we hope that they 
they circled the, the potatoes on the lawn that it's a vegetable because we thought to Although it's amazing that. how many people think potatoes go in the grains group. Yeah, because it's a starchy food, so they think that's what we hope, like, by our education, we... They've learned it's a vegetable, it's a starchy vegetable, but it's a vegetable. But we also discovered the way that we were asking some of the questions, because it was just questions that we wrote, um, weren't really geared towards, or... I don't know. Very, I don't think they were written as well as we wanted them to, yeah. so we weren't getting the data that we wanted. So we paired with our epidemiologist, uh, uh, epidemiologists, epidemiologists, <laughs> and we um, worked with how we were wording that. We mm -hmm. also looked back at some of the curriculums that we had looked at, um, yeah. Foodmaster in particular, which has some wonderful post testing, and we took some of those questions and some of that wording so we could um, try and change the wording. You may notice. Um, so you'll see. It. On um, most of, on these post tests, it does increase. However, on 2018 to 2019 school year, like the nutrients in the dairy decreased on the post test because that dark blue is that post test. Um, and so we were still looking at that, but and we were trying to figure story. out why people were missing that so much. And then um, while I was giving the post test this past spring, there's this one little boy, and he's one of those little boys that you just love to teach. He's a fifth grader. He's going into sixth grade. Um, smart as a whip, love to learn, excited about new things, and he's taking the post test. And the question is, you know, which nutrients do you find in the dairy group? And it's A protein, B calcium, C vitamin D, or D all of the above. And we don't really focus that you get protein from dairy. We talk about it, but we really put a focus on calcium and vitamin D. And he looks up at me and he's like, "Can I circle more than one?" He's like, "Well, no, you you have to circle one." And and he's like. And he had this like frustrated, gonna chew his lip like, and I knew exactly what his problem was and I couldn't fix it in that moment. But afterwards I talked to him about it and I was like, so you knew it was calcium and vitamin D. He's like, yeah, because we talked about it like 700 times. Of course I knew that. And he was kind of, a, you know, a smart kid. So had a little bit of smart mouth, but in a cute way. And he's like, yeah, I knew that. And I was like, so but you weren't sure it was protein. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so when you're taking a test, and you have to pick one, one of your choices is all of the above, and you are dead sure that two of them are right, it's all of the above. And to me, that's that's just something I know. But to him, as a fifth grader, that's a test-taking strategy that he hasn't learned yet. He's learned it now, and he'll apply it, but when we wrote the question, it didn't occur to us that they didn't know what to do with an all of the above question yeah. and what to do if they were confused about something like that. So we're gonna talk to our epidemiologists again and. Change it. And change yeah. how we <laughs> ask that question. <laughs> Always changing. Okay, so there are a couple of pictures um, from Cooking Club. So you'll see at the bottom picture, the kids are, we just love this picture, massaging kale. So it's something that I even discovered recently, just massaging kale really breaks up the fibers. It makes it sweeter. It's much more palatable and enjoyable. So we really make sure the kids are hands-on because we split them up into groups of only four because for the first year we tried it we put them all at one table and it did we're like this is not working <laughs> so we split them up no. into groups of four to make sure they're really hands-on yeah and that they all get to do something and so always having them hands-on um introducing them to new foods and then at the top is that the picture of our celebration day so yes we do offer it as a five-week curriculum where we focus each week on a different food group but they can extend it to six weeks to have a celebration day. So when we first started doing this, um, we had the parents come in. and so Or we the had kids, them invite their parents. Yes, invite their parents. And so the kids can show off their skills because on celebration day, it's about showing off their skills. They make a French toast. And so cracking eggs, making a custard, flipping the bread, washing, using, the, washing the fruit, using a knife and cutting the fruit. We teach them knife skills and appropriate ways to use that under supervision. Um, because there's a lot of tools you use in a kitchen that can be dangerous. So we want to make sure that we take some, we demystify some of those so they will use them safely under correct supervision. I'm not telling kids just go in the kitchen and grab the knife. <laughs> uh, but this past year when we were at a school, one of the um, coordinators had the idea to bring the staff in instead of the parents because we had some, some schools where, you know, three kids, three kids, parents, our family members could come in and the others couldn't and so they felt left out so the staff is perfect because um, most of them are there anyway yeah. it's not like teachers leave when the kids leave they're still at school and yeah. they smell what we're making and they want to come eat it yeah. and the kids then are so like i got yeah. to bring the librarian or yeah. i brought the you know the language arts teacher i brought the pe teacher and so then 
and they're kind of like they brought their own special teacher mm -hmm. and it makes sense because like my Megan and I both work full-time would yeah. we always be able to go to a three o'clock event at our kids school no. maybe it depends <laughs> on the day but yeah probably not so and we just found that that was really successful and like well, it's like, I mean it's so amazing to see how proud they are of themselves so we enjoy doing the celebration day if we can it is an extra a dollar per person so if we were doing it for both sessions it's 32 dollars however this past year we did the 250 dollars we were able to get it like yeah. about 240 with all the cooking club and including celebration, celebration day, day. Yeah. um so finally we also have other community collaborations we do it's not just bike club and cooking club although that's a lot of what we do we do teach nutrition in the classroom primarily that's going to be for your kinder or pre-k through second because um, once they hit third grade, it's really hard to get in those classrooms because mm -hmm. they have to make sure they hit all of that curriculum prior to state testing. Um, we also have a, one of our many community partnerships and probably one of my favorite is with our local minor league baseball team, the Tulsa Drillers. And um, we have a, an assembly style education that we do that is called Sugar Shockers. And it used to be based on that, which is a very common curriculum you can buy out there. Um, and we still call it that, but we have completely rewritten and changed it. So instead of just saying, you know, like sugar's bad, we talk about added sugar and the difference between added sugar and natural sugar, but also how you will get added sugar in your life. It's, it's very difficult to avoid it. So how to read and interpret a food label to identify where that added sugar is, know how much you shouldn't have more than or what your upper limit is, which is 24 grams for children, or six teaspoons and then wear it to find it so they can make those informed choices because we do this assembly for third through fifth or sixth grade if it's Tulsa public schools because their elementary schools go to sixth grade um, but eventually and they're not making a lot of food choices themselves but eventually middle school high school they're they're going to be picking up foods in convenience stores and they're going to be choosing their own foods so making sure that they know to turn that package around and what they're looking for and if we can kind of get in when they're in elementary school and make that a habit for them, mm -hmm. then that's what we do. So that is what we have for you today. I wonder if there are any questions at all or. Super, thank you so much. Uh, oh, let me turn my thing on. Uh, a couple of questions that have come in uh, through the chat box chat box can you tell us a little bit about how your program is funded and or any recommendations for folks on how to get a program like this funded so we are um we are the tulsa health department so we are funded primarily through um through levy funding so we are property taxes are the majority of our funding however some other divisions and departments in the health department have different sets of funding. So like our healthy living program is uh, grant funded based off of TSET, which is the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust, which is the state of Oklahoma. During the tobacco settlements, um, all those times ago, they invested that money into a trust. So it, and there's a lot of wonderful things that are funded out of that. Um, there's a lot of grant funding out there. I don't know specifically, mainly because our funding is pretty much locked in with um, you know, with the property taxes and how we our, our budget works. However, a lot of the schools that we work with, like th that don't have an active PTA, they can just shell out $250 for a cooking club or something like that. They have gotten through community partnerships, like one of our schools had a local grocery store, Morello's, um, donate the food. Another one did it so they had different um, parents sign up, like one brought in the flour and one brought in the oil and one did the paper towels and one did the paper plates and took a lot of that cost off of it. So for cooking club that can be handled for things like the blender bike, a lot of that is, is through finding specific grants, which there are a lot. And like I said, the bike is expensive, but that's not a huge grant. It's if you're writing that grant and you, you I mean, a $3,000 grant's not and that's for the bike and some of the food and then finding community partnerships to pay for the materials after the bike is paid for. Um, it's not as, it's not as massive as you think it might be. Right. And in terms of when we're thinking about the WISC model and the different components of the WISC, are there traditional or typical partners that you all engage with to get this within the schools? And are there non-traditional ones that you've had luck um, you know, ones that we might not think about. Um, so we work, primarily we work with the school districts themselves and the, the schools on an individual basis. So we have um, MOUs with 
um, seven there's, different yeah. districts. There's 14 districts in Tulsa County. I think we have MO. So that gets us into a lot of the schools, although on a school by school basis, you really need that administration buy in the principal, the vice principal, the counselor, the nurse, a few motivated teachers that want us in there. Um, but we also partner with other community organizations. So we've got the Tulsa Food Bank, OSU Extension. Um, so our extension services are very helpful to us. Yeah. The Food Bank is another one that we use quite a bit. So I'd say those are our, our major ones. Mm -hmm. And then within the health department, there's different um, areas of the health department, healthy living program. We work with quite a bit. And like I said, they're TSET funded, so. Terrific. Can you also um, tell us, do you have materials from your programs like the blender bike or cooking club that you could share with the participants? We do. Yeah. So um, if you go to our website, and actually I'm going to skip to there, tulsaplay.org, most of our materials are available there in PDF form. If it's not posted there, if you just email Megan or I, we will be more than happy to send you a PDF of anything. Like I said, we're the health department, so like any other governmental agency, our materials are, are yours to use. They're just really well branded, so <laughs> you'll see IAK on everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I also wanted to note that um, Dr. Larry Olson made a note that uh, those um, the selection or the the option to select all of the above is troublesome. So I yeah. think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. Well, and the, when he looked up and he was just like, "Can I pick two? And I was like, "Oh my gosh, he doesn't know how to deal with this question." Right, right. Hard enough to know he didn't, like, he's like, I knew the end, he was mad because he just, he wanted to be, yeah. but it's a test taking skill. And you don't think about that after going through grad school. Like I've taken so many tests. I, I don't think back to yeah. when I was learning how to take a test. <laughs> right, right. So if we want to get a hold of you for any additional questions, these are the emails to yes. reach out to you. Terrific. Wonderful. Well, we're, we so much appreciate sharing your your time and expertise with us and sharing all the great work that you've been doing. We're, we're thrilled to learn more about what you're doing and keep up the good work and kudos to Oklahoma for um, investing their, uh, their um, uh, tobacco settlement money and, and using that for for health and not. PSAT does some amazing things. If you shape your future okay is one of the is their website, I think and it's what they do and what they've been able to do is is amazing. We get to see it every day. Yeah. Um, and our what, what we do, I've talked to a lot of other dietitians, public health dietitians, community dietitians. I don't know anybody else who has a job like mine or do, has the ability to do what I do. So, you know, it's I think it's really it's it's special and unique that we get to do this. And I hope that people can take what we've had the opportunity to put together and use it as a toolkit to. Um, you know, expand the reach of nutrition education. Yeah, it's pretty fabulous. Well, keep up the good work and we appreciate it very much. I want to tell everyone that in terms of continuing education for this webinar, this is eligible for one uh, continuing education hour for CHES or MCHES, which is through NCHEC, ABC, XYZ. Sorry for all of the acronyms. Uh, it is also eligible for a CNE um, for nurses. Um, as well as you can get a participation um, uh, certificate if you need to submit it to a different entity. Um, members, as you remember, will receive a free continuing education credit and you can obtain that by completing the webinar evaluation, which is in the chat box. There's a link in the chat box. So you can go right there and fill that out immediately if you'd like. Um, I want to let you all know or remind you of our um, conference in Cincinnati. I hope you'll join us. There is our contact information if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, I also want to say for those of you who are not members, the um, continuing education is $20 for a CE or excuse me, a CNE or CHES, MCHES um, or $10 for participation. So. There was a question in the chat box. I want to make sure I got to. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Melissa and Megan, for all of your wonderful expertise. And thank you, Caitlin, for keeping us on track and uh, taking care of things behind the scenes. So everyone have a wonderful day. And thank you so much. Thank you.